Hello, everyone. We're here today to talk to you about how we implemented an event time merge of two Kafka streams with Spark Streaming. With me is my colleague, Ralph. I'm Sebastian. Hello again. What we've planned for today is to first introduce us very briefly, tell you who we are, who we work for, and then get right to the interesting part of showing you what our setup is, the problem we ran to, into with our setup, and what approach we took to solve the problem. Then afterwards, Ralph will get to the requirements our approach had to fulfill. We show you some code, how we implemented those requirements. And at the end, we we'll wrap up with the lessons learned we had why we implemented the, the solution. So, who are we? Ralf is the technical designer of our tracking team. He's been there for around three years. Um, I joined as a developer around two and a half years ago. We both like to cycle. And if you want to contact us, just use our Twitter handles so you can see here. So, who are we working for? Our company is called Otto. It's the second largest e-commerce company in Germany. We have around one million visitors every day. And if you want to find out how we develop software, how we use continuous delivery, you can check out our blog. It's dev.auto.de. We have a few articles in English. Most of them are in German, though, so, so be aware. And if you want to work with us, our jobs page is auto.de slash jobs. You can go there or just write Ralph or myself an email and we'll forward you to the right person. So, to the interesting part, our setup. When a customer visits our website, we have a Varnish reverse proxy, which handles those requests and dispatches them to verticals. Our web shop is composed of verticals, so we have many verticals, each of them responsible for a certain business domain, such as order or user, product, those domains. And if a vertical responds to a request from a user, it attaches certain tracking information to that response. And the varnish takes those tracking information and sends them to a Kafka topic, from which on our tracking server, which we deploy continuous um, and ex takes those tracking information, does its business logic, aggregations, and sends them to another Kafka topic from which on other consumers take the tracking information and use them themselves. So this is basically our setup. It's a bit simplified, but to get the problem along, it's very sufficient. So the problem we ran into is that a vertical of ours, the order vertical in our case, wanted to send us large tracking messages. And the varnish wasn't um, capable of processing those tracking messages, so we had to find a way around that. What we did, our approach to solving the problem, is we introduced a second Kafka topic you can see here, um, the vertical one is now sending messages directly to a second Kafka topic and not going through the varnish. And we also had, have a Spark service, which consumes both topics and then merges those messages by a shared key. We then, uh, the service then sends those messages to another Kafka topic from which on our tracking server can consume those messages and it doesn't, have to, or it doesn't have to bother with the merging of those messages. And from there on, it continues just as before. So that's our approach. We introduced a new Spark service. We have two topics from which we consume. And now, I want to show you the requirements this approach had to fulfill and how we implemented those in code. And I'm going to hand over to Ralph. Thanks, Sebastian. Actually, uh, the problem appeared to us uh, really simple. So we thought oh, it shouldn't be a hard problem. Uh, but then when we gave a second thought about it, there were some problems. So the easy way is just messages with the same key are merged. So we have some business key like an ID. It's depicted as ID here. And we want to try to merge the, oh, we want to try to merge them into merge sets. But then, uh, messages also have to be timed out. Why do we need this? Because there might be messages 
um, for example, uh, with ID 1, you won't have any corresponding message in the second um, message source. So there's only information in one topic, and you have to cover this. So how do you cover this? You have to have some kind of clock. So we came up with um, the maximum of the business event timestamp. So every business event has his um, event timestamp when it took place, when the customer just um, clicked something or did something. And we can calculate a timeout for this merge set based on this event timestamp, on this clock. It's a kind of clock. But then, um, event streams might get stuck because some system might be uh, redeploying, so we do continuous delivery, we deploy. Uh, the source systems are potentially deployed about 20 times a day, so we cannot guarantee that there won't be any delays, and we have to cover up this. If we didn't, we would uh, time out merge sets, which would be incomplete, and would introduce an error. So what we came up with was a requirement that we have two different clocks, or for more streams, you would have more clocks, and then you take uh, the minimum of all those clocks, and this is, uh, this is your new um, business clock. Furthermore, uh, there might be no messages in one source. So another case would be um, several messages have accompanying uh, corresponding information in the second source, others don't. What will happen if, for a limited time, there are only messages which don't have any information in the, in the other message source? So we came up with a heartbeat. So the heartbeat will um, just tell us that the system is up and that the connections and the Kafka queuing and everything is, uh, is working. And we can now, again, calculate uh, a clock and, for example, time out messages. OK. Uh, so to sum it up, uh, we have uh, messages with the same key should be merged. Messages are timed out by the combined event time of both source topics or multiple source topics, and timed out messages shall be sorted by event time. So now uh, we have our requirements set up, and we just go into the solution. Uh, messages should be merged with the same ID. So um, we decided just to use updated state by key, which is a stateful calculation, which is uh, offered by Kafka Streaming. But uh, whom of you does know updated state by key did use it? Uh, some hands. Um, and it's defined on pairwise RDDs. So you have a key and a value, and the pair. Uh, the first part of the pair actually is a key. Sure. Um, it applies a function to all new messages and calculates um, a, state, a new state for this. And it returns also a D-stream with the resulting messages. In further detail, we start with a D-stream of input messages and uh, in, there might be uh, some RDD in this input message, and then you have some resulting RDDs from your transformation. And what's special about update state by key is you will have the same result uh, going out of your update state by key function uh, will be exactly the same what you have as a history RDD in the next um, micro batch iteration. Um, so in the update function. You just get uh, your new input messages. You have an option of, m of some uh, state. And um, you will result in an option of a new state. So you will only see um, the information for one key. And you can just transform the information. And if you return none, the history will be none in the next stage. If you would return some result, you will get the result, and you will always process um, your result as the history IDD in the next micro batch iteration. So that's about updates zip by key. So, 
I, I continue with the implementation. So what we did is we have a merge function which takes an input stream of our messages, of our uh, D-stream of our input messages. And what we do then is to get a pairwise D-stream, we map over it and extract the, in this our case, the SS ID, which is the key on which we want to merge, and have that as a key, and the value is just the message. So this is a precondition to actually use update state by key. You need a pairwise stream. What we do then is we call update state by key, which allows us to update the state by key, and to do that, we pass an update state function. This update state function will then return a new DStream, which is actually a state DStream of string, which is the key, and merge message, which, which is the value. What the update state function does, I will show you on the next slide. So we'll have this update state function, which takes input messages. So that are all new, in, no, all new messages in this micro batch for one key. We are always, when we, when we have an update state function, it always handles the messages and state for one key. So we have the input messages, all new input messages for our key, and the history for our key. It's an option because there can be a history for our key or there can be none. And the result of the function is an option of our history type, so merge message. Why is it an option? If you return none, you delete the state you currently have. And if you return some, you have a state for the key. So what we actually need to do is we just need to check with, our, uh, with the pattern matching if we have new input messages for our key or if we have no new input messages for our key, we just return the history as it was. So, as you can see, this function is also called when we don't have any new input messages, but also, but we have a history. So it's for every micro batch, this function is called no matter if there are new input messages or not. If there's a history, this function will get called. Um, if we have new input messages, but no new, and but no existing history. We'll just create a history from our input messages and call ourselves recursively to add additional input messages if there are any. If we have a state and input messages, we add the first, uh, first message to this date and then call ourselves again. So this is how the update state by key works. It's actually Spark does most of it for us because we get the new input messages and the state we just have to merge the input messages with the state. And now Ralph goes on. Okay. Um, so this is nice and easy, but then we came up with, with some new block, with some block in the world. And it was, uh, we have to flag and remove timed out messages. So if we get a timeout, we want to process uh, the data further and uh, give it to the uh, downstream systems but we only want to do this once. So if you look at this diagram, you see messages are coming in, and they will be processed, and uh, the message right now um, is not timed out. It is not, we use a flag for this in the message after processing, and it will be flagged as not timed out. So it should be filtered before it goes downstream, because uh, only the, uh, um, timed out results should uh, proceed. But still, this message is in, uh, um, goes to two places. It goes um, into, into the result. And as I already said, it will also be present, this message, in the uh, history state RDD. And uh, if we go on, it says the second uh, RDD. And it will alter the timestamp because there are more messages. And this alter timestamp will result in uh, flagging of this message set, of this merge set, as being timed out. So this time, uh, it will proceed, and it will have some result in the downstream systems. So, but we don't want to repeat this. So it, uh, as you already can see, this timed out message also uh, proceeded into the um, 
history state of the next micro batch. So what we do is, um, when it arrives there, um, it is um, part of the calculation in the, in the third uh, micro batch stage, and it will be filtered out because it has this timeout flag. So the pattern is just you give it a flag, um, and then if it is flagged, you use it in the uh, downstream processing, but you will filter it out in the next step um, so that it won't be repeated in the update function. That's it. But then, uh, how do we get to the business clock? Because as we already said, it, um, you only get the information for one uh, ID. So you could do this uh, perfectly if you would only have a clock consisting of one ID. But we wanted a clock which uh, would um, use uh, all IDs, all data which is coming in. And uh, so right. perhaps I could give over to Sebastian. <laughs> um, yes, like Raj said, we need the business time in our update state by key function because that's the only place where we can actually update the state. You could think, okay, why don't we just merge the keys and then join it with another stream in the end and then time out messages. That doesn't work. You only can only update the state for a key within update state by key. So we somehow need to access all messages from the current micro batch and the state to compute the um, event time or the business time from the event times. And that's not possible with the state DStream Kafka comes with. So we implemented our own custom DStream, which gives access to all messages from the current micro batch and the state. That allows us to compute the maximum business or the business time from the maximum event timestamps of all messages. So how did we do that? This looks actually pretty similar to the thing we saw before, the update state by key, but it's quite different. So we again have our stream of input messages. We again create a pairwise stream but this time, we have an update state by key merge function. This, what this function does, it, it's crea it creates a custom state stream, which allows access to the all input messages and all of the state. And we pass not an update state function, but we p uh, pass a function which creates an update state function. So it's a higher order function. What it exactly does, we'll look at now on the next slide. So our create update state function actually receives all input messages and our history messages, like I said before. And we can compute with calculate minimum business clock function, we can compute the minimum business clock for each partition, because we have to do it for every partition. And we also compute minimum offsets per partition. What we need those for, I'll get to later. But the important part to see is, when you look at the function signature, what we return is another function which has the same signature we saw before in our update state function, which we pass to the regular update state by key. So update state, which you see, uh, which is the return value, is actually a multi-value, uh, a multi-parameter list function. So the first two parameters of that function are the, is the minimum business clock and the minimum offsets. And we return a function which acts just like the regular update state function, with the difference that we have access to the minimum business clock. And I'll show you on the next slide how the update state function looks. So the update state function has now access to the minimum business clock and the minimum source topic offsets. Ignore that for now. And as, as a second parameter list, it is just like a regular update state function, the one we saw before. So what we d can do now is we are able to flag messages if they are timed out. How we do that, I'll show you on the next slide. But the other part is similar to what we saw before and what Ralph showed us on the slide. 
we go to the input, uh, we iterate over the input messages, filter all heartbeats because we don't want to merge those. Um, we merge our input messages with the history just as we did with our regular update state function. And then we drop timed out messages from the state because once a message has been timed out, we want to drop it so it doesn't, isn't sent again in our downstream consumer, from our downstream consumer. And then at the end, we flag a message if it's timed out. So we remove messages which are timed out and we flag newly timed out messages. So that's the signal for them to be sent to downstream consumers. Flag if timed out, we'll look at that now. What does it do? Well, it takes a merged method, message, it has access to the minimum business clocks. The important part here is um, the is timed out, the rest is ignore that for now. So we have minimum business clocks, we can get for our petition the minimum business clock and then we just check if our timestamp, the message timestamp is too far behind our business clock and we'll time out that message. So what we did is, at the beginning, we compute our um, minimum business clock, we create our new update state function which has access to that minimum business clock and is thus uh, able to time out messages while merging keys. There were the basic requirements and the advanced requirements Ralph will get to now again. Yes. So what we find out is that there are additional requirements uh, which are not core to the business. I think we explained this right now how we could merge two Kafka streams or, or any number of Kafka streams, but what else could happen? And what we found was um, one thing is um, what could happen, you could have very different uh, request rates in your, in your topics. So one topic might have uh, about 10,000 messages per second and the other one might have about 10 you know, or something like that. And what is a requirement for us? We, when we have a downtime, when we do a deployment or uh, there's any uh, um, operational glitch, we want to, um, um, to catch up with, uh, with the uh, in input information. And uh, so maybe we catch up with 5K messages per micro batch. And if we would just throttle both um, topics the same, we would just, in, in the first micro batch, just catch everything out of here and only the first bar out of here. And then we would have uh, ingested a lo lot of information which ca we cannot use. So this leads to some operational instability because you could get to an OOM just if you have enough information inside here which you just store on top of the needed information. So, uh, so what we wanted to do is to handle different request rates and topics. Uh, we want to stop reading from one topic if the even time of the other topic is uh, too far behind. Um, and what we have to do for this, we have to store the latest even time of each topic and partition on the driver. And then we came up with a custom Kafka D stream, which has a clamp method and will just use this information and say, okay, am I now, um, should I now consume from this topic or shouldn't I? So I think Sebastian will explain it in detail. Yes, what we did here is when we are on the driver and we have global variables on the driver which store for each topic, our tracking and order topic, that's the names, store for each partition the maximum timestamp we saw. That's where we store the timestamps. What we need to do now is give our custom Kafka DStream access to those timestamps. How we do that is when we create oops, when we create the stream, we pass two anonymous functions to that stream, which let us let it access those information. So the stream class is now able to access the latest timestamp for every topic, for its own topic and also for the other topic. So we can compare both timestamps and throttle one topic if it's necessary. 
So we do this for both streams, for the tracking stream. I omitted this one here. This is to allow access to these informations. We now also need to update that information. And how we do this is once we created those streams, we add a new function, or we call a function on each stream, which updates the maximum timestamps. It, for every micro batch, it updates those timestamps with the maximum timestamps it saw. So we have the information on the driver. We allow the Kafka D stream to access that information with the anonymous functions. We update those values in here for every micro batch. And now we are going to look at the clamp method of the, our custom Kafka D stream. So the clamp method, what it does is for every partition of its topic, it obtains its own timestamp value. That is the anonymous function we passed into the class. So th this shows that. So we have that for our own timestamp, and we have that for the timestamps of the other topic. So we know how far we are ahead, or they are, the other topic is ahead, etc. And we have, when we have these values, we can now simply check with a match if we are too, f if we don't have any timestamp values for our own topic yet. We'll just continue to read to get values so we can compare. If we have values, but the other topic doesn't have values yet, we stop read to read and wait until the other topic has values so we can compare. Once we are able to compare, we check if we're too far ahead, we stop reading, and if it's fine, we'll just continue to read with the offsets. The regular, the default Kafka D stream would suggest. Okay. I think we have to skip this. <laughs> I don't know. I, I think we have to uh, hurry up, really, but um, just briefly, another problem we had is we do this continuous delivery and we have uh, uh, the problem we cannot use um, um, to be built in uh, Spark mechanisms to, to store your um, offset, where you start again if, if your system goes down and it goes up again. And, that, and what we did is we use just the sync topic, and when we go up again, we will read the, um, the latest message from the sync topic, and there will be the offsets for, our, uh, for starting again. So we don't rely on uh, Spark checkpoints, but we use this me mechanism. So I, I'm sorry, we will have to skip over the uh, implementation this time um, and uh, advance to the lessons learned to us. And I think um, what was really nice about Spark, it was excellent performance and scalability. So we don't ha have any problems to process uh, if we are catching up about 40,000 uh, messages per second. Um, and what we learned, and I hopefully demonstrated to you, is that uh, the RDDs uh, and, and the RDD API, API um, using Scala is really nicely extensible. So you, have, can, you can come up with custom RDDs, as we did, and we, you can do uh, ex extensions to the direct Kafka consumer um, to allow for clamping. What was with that for us is that we had to do all this because if there would be something like time-based windowing in Spark, uh, there would be much easier solutions. And uh, but also, what's not that nice is that you cannot use checkpointing because checkpoints um, always cover also the uh, 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 execution graph. So if you change your execution graph between deployments, you cannot uh, rely on the checkpoint. And we think the driver and executor model is very powerful, but also a bit complex. I don't know if this uh, was transparent. This is local variable for on, on the driver, and then you have to do something on the executor. And I think you have, uh, if you uh, uh, if you program on that level, you have to care a lot about this. I think that's 
it for now, and we are happy for questions, but our time is really limited. Well, thank you very much. We only got 30 seconds. If you have a quick, short question, and if you're dying for coffee, let's hurry up. <laughs> Any questions? Well, big round for yourself and Sigmund. Thank you very much. <laughs>